This is Jadecast, your gateway to traditional martial arts and Chinese culture. Brought to you by your host, Shuffle Jonathan Bluestein. Hey there everyone, welcome back to JadeCast. Today I got a really special guest, Avin Ardiasensei, a friend of mine and a colleague, someone whom I respect deeply and I've known for many years now. He is really quite a character in the martial arts. Just to give you a sense about the breadth of knowledge and qualifications this guy has, all right? And this is, this is a short list. He is a major in the Israeli Defense Forces. He was an, an instructor for the Israeli SWAT teams. Seventh Dan in Aiki Kenpujutsu and Kuyu Uchi Nadi Kate under Patrick McCarthy Sensei, a very famous karateka and teacher and also a famous author. And I'm gonna have Patrick Sensei also on the podcast in the not so distant future. He is sixth Dan in Japanese swordsmanship and Jodo in the Moso Shindenryu and 6th Dan in Kendo and 5th Dan in Iaido. He's 5th Dan in Japanese Jiu-Jitsu. He's 5th Dan in Kyodo under Ono Sensei from Chichibo. He's 4th Dan in Judo. I think it's 5th Dan by now. He's 1st Dan in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu under Professor John Machado, a highly respected BJJ instructor. Uh, and I'm told by Avi, not just highly respected, but extremely skilled and nice guy. Yeah, he's got all sorts of certifications in Israeli martial arts. He's, of course, a high-ranking black belt in his own uh, system of Krav Maga called Kepap. We'll get to what that later on. A certified Olympic f- fencing instructor by the Wingate Sports Institute in Israel. A certified Jiu-Jitsu instructor by Israeli Ministry of Sport. Certified Kendo instructor by Israeli Ministry of Sport. Certified Thai boxing instructor. Uh, certified uh, martial arts coach by Wingate. Um, Personal trainer, uh, certified by Tel Aviv University, diving instructor, boxing instructor, rappelling instructor, you name it, this guy has really been there, done that. I mean, really. And th- this, this is a short list. This could go on for pages and pages. So I brought Avi Sensei to the podcast today. We, really, we could talk about anything martial arts, but I figured something that really is of great interest to uh, quite a lot of people all over the world is Krav Maga. Like, oh, what the hell is Krav Maga? It's all over the place. Nowadays, it's not just martial arts. It's a brand, right? It, you see it in Hollywood films. It's in the newspapers. The Mossad is using it? Yes? No? Really? So what is this? The martial art, a group of martial arts, a style and a system. And where did it come from? Well, Avi Sensei and I are really going to get deep and dirty into the history of Krav Maga and open it up and reveal to you some really interesting and at times bitter and controversial truths about where Krav Maga came from and what it really is. And we are going to be very honest and sincere with you when we discuss those details. We will try to not get too political. Uh, It's impossible as we are in the martial arts and it always gets political by the end of the day but if we have something less than kind to say we would tr- attempt to refrain from naming names you know that those in the know know who would be ta- we would be talking about in any case um without further ado i present to you Avin Ardias and say a great man and you just hear from him what he has to say Avi and say welcome to the podcast Thank you very much. I'm happy to be uh, with you guys. So Avi and I have known each other for quite a few years now, and I really trust him as a teacher and as an authority on Krav Maga and martial arts in general, both traditional sports, non-traditional. He's been there and done a lot of things. So Avi, let's uh, get right into it. Krav Maga is a big brand now internationally and has been for at least 20 years. And a lot of people are wondering, where did that thing, is it like a brand, a martial art, what is it really? Where did it come from? 
So before we answer the historical question, could you define for us, for the listeners, what Krav Maga actually is? Well, if you look for definition, Krav is a combat and Maga is a touch. So actually it's a close quarter combat, I would say, like CQC, close quarter combat or close quarter uh, battle, uh, CQB. And uh, the, the Maga means touch. So like once you have uh, like uh, what we say in English, hand to hand, that's Krav Maga, hand to hand. Uh, it's a little bit different, for example, from Kapap, which is face to face. And in a face to face, you have also more distance and also more maybe firearm. Ramaga is more about the hand to hand, which again, uh, it's very difficult uh, to put um, one line, but as a name, this is the meaning like hand to hand. All right. So now that we understand the meaning of the name in Hebrew, let me ask you this for our listeners are we talking about a specific martial art or is it more like the term kung fu or kung fu which pertains to a large array of styles and systems exactly like uh, the definition that you gave uh, some people try to say there's one krav maga and uh, it's like to say there's one wing tune there's one uh, kung fu or karate and actually, even when we go to Krav Maga, you can see a lot of different uh, streams and different uh, uh, source and different roots of Krav Maga. There's no one Krav Maga. And that's why you see a lot of arguments. It's like my Kung Fu is better than your Kung Fu, while we actually are all teaching some kind of a Kung Fu. All right. Let me ask you, how many Krav Magas are there? I mean, like dozens of styles, hundreds, what do you think? Well, it depends on which years, you know, like uh, the more that it gets popular, the more styles you get. And uh, mm -hmm. I will say that, you know, like, like anything else, uh, you know, like if you look at 2000, there was only one school that teach Kapap, my school. If you look today, people that pop up like five years ago or one year ago, they claim to be the real Krav Maga or, or Kapap. And this is exactly like when you, you know, when you start to see I'm the real and they are the fake, you, you have to be careful because uh, people that work for a long run, they don't care. They have, they're already, their believers. I don't see people that um, are very well established, like let's say uh, Sifu Deni no Santo that need to prove to anybody that is better than others or that his style is work. And every time there is a new guy in town, he will be a little bit provocator. And that's, that's the new kid in town. Uh, I will say that um, when Krav Maga start, I will say there were not many schools. When Krav Maga get popular, there's more and more schools that it's not only from a bad way, it's also from uh, splits, uh, fights in between organizations that split, and sometimes it uh, has different roots because um, there's a Krav Maga that, for example, attracts to uh, Ime Lichtenfeld or Ime or Sadeh, rest in peace. But uh, this Krav Maga is a one style and a one source. Um, this source has nothing to do many times with other Krav Maga that established by different founders and different uh, roots and different uh, teachers. So if I go to the army, I still teach Krav Maga. It don't mean that I must teach the Krav Maga of X or Y or Z. So there's a lot of teachers that uh, actually teaching in the Israeli army. And that's why a lot of confusion, uh, because you know, when you come to hand to hand, there's, there's no one style and uh, even like when you go to karate or kung fu there's no anymore one style and even when you go to tai chi there is two maybe basic style like yin and yang but then each of them split to hundreds so i think the more krav maga will get popular the more styles and organizations that we will see all right so you mentioned emil lichtenfeld or Imi uh, Sdeor. Sdeor is, is basically uh, the Hebrew transliteration of the 
named Lichtenfeld. And he is one of the historical founders of what eventually became, it was called later Krav Maga. But if we look back to the time of Emil Lichtenfeld and we talk more about him uh, soon, then even at, in that time when Krav Maga was just being created, there wasn't a singular individual who was creating this, right? There were several founders of actually several se separate systems that eventually became, earned the name Krav Maga. And here I want to also say something about Israeli culture. For someone listening out of a place like Germany or Switzerland or even the United States, it might sound odd that the Israeli Defense Forces, the IDF, would allow many different things called Krav Maga that would not have the same curriculum. But in oh. Israeli culture, people feel at ease even when a curriculum is non-standardized. In other cultures, it's very important to have that sort of order. But in Israeli culture, it's more acceptable for people to create the original, improvise. It is accepted by society and even by larger organizations because the yardstick for uh, something is whether it, it works, whether it is effective, and not whether it is orderly. So that's quite different. Now, going back to the founders of Krav Maga. So Emil Lichtenfeld, um, when did this person live? You know, it's again, uh, it, it's a lot of issues because uh, when you go even to the history, uh, Emil Lichtenfeld, rest in peace. Uh, by so, the way, sorry, could, you, I go, could you repeat? What, what was I he? Said that, I said, Emil Lichtenfeld, rest in peace. Mm -hmm. Even when I go now, I still see certificates signed by him, which is already passed away. So people using a lot of time, dead people, to promote themselves, actually. They don't do it to promote the dead man as to, to legit themselves as they are the last, you know, he was the only one and I'm the last samurai after. So, uh, but when you check really the history, and if, I, if you can see even in the military, Israeli IDF, the army dictionary, uh, in the army dictionary, by the Ministry of Defense in 1965, uh, Krav Maga was not definition as the military system. The hand-to-hand -hand system was Kappa. Now, now that take us more history, actually to 1930, 1940, when actually people like uh, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais, rest in peace, and this kind of generation started to create some martial art uh, generation in Israel. And uh, for example, uh, Dr. Feldenkrais was the first black belt in judo by Jigoro Kano. And he wrote the first book, Combative, by, um, you know, for the uh, British army. And uh, today they call it Hadaka Jime, based on some chalk, naked uh, chalk or... Um, so, <clears throat> When uh, Dr. Feldenkrais moved to Israel, and he's very famous because he's one of the also fitness instructor for Ben Gurion, this generation, they start to teach uh, actually what developed more as Kapap. And if you look for uh, Yuda Marcus, rest in peace, and many other instructors, including the one of the last one was uh, Michel Orovitz, uh, rest in peace. And when I met him, I met uh, Michel Orovitz and I tried to, you know, I gave him the, my Kapap book and my Kapap DVD and he was smile. And then he showed me the book by Moshe Feldenkrais. It was one of the manual books that they actually used in the old days in the Palmach, which is a strike platoons. And uh, that's where, again, if you look and you go really to the history, there was no curriculum. There was no one system. There was no method because uh, like when Israel start as a country, it's come from different resources, different people that emigrate to Israel until things start to get more, um, like, you know, in, in a 
countries that uh, run for a long time and then start to get more regulation, more structure. So when you look for the Israeli martial art in the beginning, I don't think it has a real structure like it has maybe today. And the things actually been much more dynamic. And uh, a lot of uh, the people, they are missing because they died already in the history. And even uh, when you read one interview with uh, Dr. Moshe Feldenkrais, rest in peace, he was laughing. He says that they study punching and fighting with a stick and they thought that they know everything about the art of war. And then a lot of people just injured and, and got killed because, you know, reality is not a joke. And well, let, me, let me stop you here, Avi, because... Uh, the thing with Avi is if you don't stop him, he's going to keep talking for seven hours. Mm -hmm. I know that for, yes. for a fact. Yeah, <laughs> I've known him for a few years. Also training. Also training. You know, I'm very uh, bad reputation for starting at five in the morning and not finish until midnight, you know. Yeah, so he's, he's certainly an energizer bunny, this guy. So I just want to go back because Avi mentioned a lot of people and a lot of circumstances. And I would like to provide with the historical background for our listeners who might not be up to speed with everything that's been going on with the state of Israel and the people who founded it in, during the 20th and 21st centuries. So uh, we started talking about Moshe Feldenkrais, uh, and a very unusual individual, uh, and it might surprise a lot of people to hear that Jigoro Kano, uh, Jigoro Kano Sensei, who had been the founder of modern judo, originally a, a Kano Sensei called it Jiu-Jitsu, by the way. It wasn't even called Judo uh, during Kano's lifetime. His first foreign black belt student had been this fellow, Moshe Feldenkrais, an Israeli Jew, of all people. So th that's quite unusual. Uh, it's reminiscent of stories like um, uh, black slaves who arrived in Japan and became samurai. It's quite an, an exceptional set of circumstances. And Moshe Feldenkrais was known as an exceptional judo teacher. And he was also unusual in that through his judo training and teaching, he came up with a holistic method for cultivating health and healing injuries. Later on in his career, much later, he became um, a personal fitness instructor for one of the main founders of the state of Israel, David Ben-Gurion, who's quite famous. And he convinced Ben-Gurion to start practicing headstands every day. And Ben-Gurion would go to the beach in Tel Aviv every day and practice those headstands, uh, originally from yoga, not from judo, to uh, help support his health. And did other things uh, that uh, Fel Feldenkrais had recommended to him. So the reason, uh, obviously, since they started talking about Moshe Feldenkrais is that he's also considered, alongside with Emil Lichtenfeld, uh, Emil Sdeor, and which is the same name, yeah, Lichtenfeld and Sdeor, again, is the Hebrew transliteration. Uh, both of these men were among those people in the early 20th century who were creating things that would later be called Krav Maga. Now, Avi also mentioned, back in 1965, the Israeli Defense Forces produced uh, a dictionary uh, for military terminology. And in the dictionary, they had to refer to those methods which they used at the time to teach hand-to-hand -hand combat. And Avi says, rightfully so, in 1965, which is before even most Israelis had heard of Krav Maga, because it gained most of its popularity throughout the 70s and 80s, the army was referring to the hand-to-hand -hand combat methods as KEPAP and not as Krav Maga. Now, what's KEPAP? KEPAP is an acronym for Krav Panim El Panim, face-to-face -face combat. Krav Panim El Panim, KEPAP, face-to-face -face combat. Um, slightly different than Krav Maga, which is something like contact combat okay so i think avi was trying to tell us here that uh krav maga is a later term it wasn't as widely used back in the 60s and prior to that rather they used the word kapap acronym for krav panim el panim um face-to-face -face combat 
which is also the name of the system which Avi teaches today. So I want to go back with Avi to the early 20th century. And you have people like Emil Lichtenfeld and Moshe Feldenkrais, and these are uh, basically Jewish people who come to the land of Israel in order to support the settlements there and try to establish a base upon which later the state of Israel would be founded. Avi, please give us a little bit of a background about that period, early 20th century, uh, 1910s, 1920s, 1930s, and why it came to be that the Jewish people even needed those martial arts. Well, I, I don't want to go too early because it will confuse, but I will go just to 1930 and uh, Maurat Tarpa. In 1930, where the Jewish settlement in uh, Hebron city, and they get slatters and butchered by the Arab or Muslim community over there. So there were a lot of, uh, actually, I don't think it's a real war, but it was a fight. The fight was more with the axe, knives, sticks. Uh, and that's why also when you go to the old Kapaf, it's based about stick fighting, which we call Naboot, which was like a, like a primitive baseball bat, you know, like yeah, very the, the narrow boot, in one the is, uh, is a word we use uh, in Israeli Hebrew to describe a club. Yeah. And uh, I think that a lot of the people were uh, shepherd, they game, they've been in the field, and as a shepherd, you always have a stick, and that's why they find themselves in the old days fighting uh, more like with a stick against two people or things like that. And um, we had a lot of stories like uh, Ashomer, like Alexander Zaid, and all of those uh, stories about people that uh, the country was uh, actually the Wild West. It's not the Israel that you see today, like very modern, very high tech and uh, buildings. So when you're on the field by yourself, and uh, a lot of time they've been uh, attacked by gangs that uh, try to robbery them murder them, rape, and uh, a lot of those kind of situation uh, forced people to start to study Kapaf. And all my teachers, when I was in uh, first grade, second grade, they were all talking about Kapaf and study Kapaf and even try to teach us as a kids in the elementary school. And they all talk about that days that they all study Kapaf. It was like one of the main things that uh, people studied. Now, Avi is in his 50s. I'm 32 years old right now. And <laughs> I'm getting to my 60s, not in my 50s. I wish. Yeah, well, still in my 50s, I'll catch you some slack. Far from my 60s yeah, you, you look younger. Okay. <laughs> I'm already 59, yes. But, but I was about to say um, so Avi is somewhat older than I am. This was true in his generation, by my generation. Uh, and I grew up in the 1990s, this was no longer being taught or considered in schools. Uh, we had a lot of overweight teachers, uh, and which were otherwise, whether healthy or not, just disinterested in any type of martial arts. It was, so paradoxically, by the 1990s, Krav Maga had become exceedingly popular all over Israel, but it was not no longer as popular in, in educational facilities, arguably because the state was better organized, the police was more functional. Because I was, was talking about the, the 1930s, even all the way to the 1940s and early 50s, Israel was really like the Wild West. There was a lot of chaos. People didn't even have phones. Uh, oftentimes, you would have a single phone for several buildings. If they even had it, people would walk a mile or two to, to access the nearest phone. You couldn't contact anybody. You, have to, you had to fend for yourself and for your family, men and women alike. And you're living um, in the span of great distances. Comparatively speaking, it's Israel is a small place, but still. And sometimes you are a half a day's walk from, from the nearest help. You had to help yourself. And I also would like to say that during those times in the 1930s, 1940s, the violence 
that was perpetrated primarily by Arabs against Jews, but also sometimes by Jews against Arabs, was not based on race, for the most part, usually, was not based on race, religion, or ethnicity. Rather, most of the strife, in my understanding, and I think in Avi's understanding too, it was a war over resources. We're talking about a land that had been decimated by an endless streak of conquerors that just kept coming for, for 2,000 years. And every time a new kingdom or a new empire got into the land of Israel, they would use up the, the wood to build their, their siege equipments and their fortresses and their temples. They would slaughter the animals to be sacrificed en masse, to, to be eaten, uh, to use for ornamentals. Uh, Israel was, over, over 2,000 years ago, Israel still had a lot of the fauna of Africa. We, it still had rhinoceros, elephants, giraffes, zebras, all manner of these interesting animals. And then gradually they became extinct. All the way to the 20th century, we still had leopards and bears. And they gradually became extinct and, and disappeared by around the 1970s to 1990s. And so this, and, but by the time that the Jews were returning to the home, their homeland to be rebuilt, there's always a Jewish population there, but more Jews were now coming the early, tw late 19th century, early 20th century. Much of the land was a desert. And even if it hadn't been a desert, it was just empty. Most of the animals were gone. Uh, it was dry. There wasn't a lot of rain because there, there hadn't been enough forests and, and vegetation to support that sort of ecosystem. Resources were scarce and people had to fight over resources, which is partly why there was a lot of fighting going on between the Jews and the Arabs. And again, I'm not saying even Muslims because it's not, it's not based on religion for the most part. It's just strife between groups, different groups that want to, to have control over certain areas. And what would happen is that the Arabs would, at times, every few months, every few weeks, would come in in small or large groups and just either perpetrate acts of ma mass thievery or often even mass murder. And again, the Jews had to fend for themselves, which is why they create they created uh, militia, paramilitary organizations that later merged and uh, became what we know now as the IDF, the Israeli Defense Forces. And these organizations, as well as uh, smaller groups and individuals, needed to have some sort of protection and develop these sorts of martial arts. Also because the Jews have been very um, scholarly people, the people of the book, the focus on studying and trade, they weren't warriors. They had, hadn't been warriors for at least 2,000 years. And whichever martial arts they had in the Bible, they've already lost. So just an example before, before we come back to Avi. Uh, in the Bible, we hear that Samson hit the Philistines shin upon thigh. You can go to the Old Testament and, and, and read that. So why, what does it mean that he hit the Philistines shin upon thigh? If you ask most rabbis these days, um, they would just tell you, oh, it means that he hit them a big blow. But that's actually a slang and a metaphor for roundhouse kick, right? Roundhouse kick to the thigh. That's shin upon thigh. That's what he did. So you had roundhouse kicks in the Old Testament, for sure. But the Jews had some forms of martial arts. It's hinted many a time in the Old Testament, but they've lost it. They have ceased being a nation of warriors and changed their ways. And then they had to recreate that sort of uh, cultural knowledge in the 20th century. So uh, I'll go back to you, Avi, and please tell us more about how Krav Maga developed in the 1930s and 40s. Or actually, not, not Krav Maga, at the time it was, it was kept up, right? Yes. Actually, what you mentioned about Samson, it was the first time mentioned low kick. Because if you translate what he say, Ika shok al 
So the shock is the lower part of our leg where the shin is. Yeah. And he hit on the neck, which is the quad. And this is where uh, actually Samson hit the, the plastic and, uh, and with the low kicks. And this is very interesting. Uh, I always mention it too. But let's go back. Uh, why they manage uh, to call it Kappa? The name is actually not important. It's important what you teach. You know, like um, we, we say that uh, when you, and I know you will understand what I'm talking now, but uh, when you put a crown on a clown, don't make him a king. <laughs> so um, many times you can put on yourself a black belt. It don't make you a black belt. You can put on yourself any title, master for Krav Maga, grandmaster. It don't make you understand Krav Maga. And it's the same. The name is not always important. People are always fighting for names and uh, who can hold the name because it's more easy. But uh, when you go to 1930, 1940, and the gentlemen that we already uh, mentioned, like uh, Feldenkrais, then you have uh, Michel Orovitz. And Michel Orovitz is, is also, for his credit, he developed the first uh, stick fight in, in Israel, which is uh, different than the Filipino martial art, but actually there's no Filipino martial art. If I give a human a stick and he play with it, he'll find out the same idea in England, in France, because it depends on our mobility. So, yeah, so just, just when you talk about, uh, Avi, when you talk about the stick, how long a stick are we talking about? Uh, again, you know, like everything, uh, you know, like has arguments. So it depends who you ask. But I will say that there were like two to three main sticks. And when you go to the Palmach cave in, uh, in Israel, and they have the history, and they have also old sticks. You can see, like, uh, actually, a few kind of stick, and uh, the Nabut is one of them. But they were also like a shepherd stick, which is like similar to the Japanese jaw. Then you have uh, something between the Japanese jaw to the Filipino Kali stick, which is a little bit longer, and then you have a very long stick. So I will say it's like uh, in in many martial arts, three different ranges uh, of a stick. And um, Michel Orovitz considered the one that created the stick fighting or developed or manual book. I met him, I, I have all the pictures, you know, old pictures. And uh, if you go like to the Palmach Museum in Tel Aviv, you can see the history of the Kapap and the Palmach. On the same time, they used to have camps outside of uh, Israel. There were camps in Europe to, to create a generation to, to make them uh, emigrant to Israel. So they also teach them already uh, different hand-to-hand uh, -hand like Kapap. And the Kapap actually developed, and actually Emil Lichtenfeld, when we go back to this name, he started as a fitness instructor in the Palmach. And as a fitness instructor in the Palmach, he was exposed also to the Kapap, and he became also Kapap instructor. Yeah, before so we it's continue, very interesting, but uh, you know, it's not... Uh, Avi, before we continue, could you please just tell the, the listeners what the Palmach is? Because you've been repeating that. Obviously, it's the name of an organization. Let's give some background. Palmach is actually strike platoon. That again, it's very funny. I was uh, in India. And I found out that uh, Ot Winget actually died in some other country, you know, like uh, for us he disappeared in Israel, but Ot Winget, which the sport university in Israel, Winget, is on his name, uh, he was sent as a military major from England. I assume, like, you know, like, you have those kind of people, special forces, that you send them to another country to, to start to make like a revolution and to develop. And Ot Winget actually start to teach the settlement in Israel uh, guerrilla fight and all the attacks early morning and how to uh, move, how to actually be a guerrilla fighter, which it start from explosive and uh, hand to hand anything that uh, guerrilla using. And actually it's because in Israel we still had the Ottoman Empire and 
The British won the Ottoman outside of Israel. And it was like a blend with a lot of promises to the Arab settlements and to the Jewish settlements, uh, who the country will be belong, which even after Balfour declaration and Israel established already as a country, those arguments are still argue, you know, who the country belong actually. But uh, you will say that uh, Ot Winget created the Palmach, it's the strike platoons, and they used to do many, uh, I will say, dirty jobs for the British until they also fight against the British in a way, but then they cooperate more with the British and actually the Etzel, which is another uh, organization, guerrilla, but the, the, the building of Israel was not, you know, like uh, step by step. It, it's, it's some kind of a dynamic that sometimes it's very even difficult to explain the, the exact history. But uh, the Palmach strike used to do a lot of operation, including uh, Chav Gimel Yodea Sira, for example, which is the 23 uh, sailors that they send them actually to Lebanon to explode the oil refinery because it's, it was all fights about oil and where the oil pipe is going to cross from south to north, you know. So there's a lot of oil war, like today, into that oil game. And the Palmach was actually doing the dirty job, like to explode the bridge. And the 23 uh, sailors actually were 24. Uh, it, it was not mentioned in Israel until now the name of Israel make a research that was also a British major on the boat. Stella Maris is on, on, on the So a lot of the history is very not clear, even to people that grow through this history. But that's where the Palmach coming, and yeah, that's where me, the Kapap coming. Let, let me fill in some details for, for the listeners, uh, because right now it might sound as if the, the Palmach was just an arm of the British military, but it's a bit more complex than that. What was going on is that those Jewish settlements that were popping up uh, all over Israel from the late 19th century, the early 20th century, uh, trying to establish a new nation needed protection. And they protect themselves partly by creating, like we said, those uh, militia-like or paramilitary-like organizations. Uh, the Palmach, perhaps the, the biggest and most famous among them. And like uh, Avi suggested, the Palmach was in fact created by a British major, Wingate, uh, who is very famous in Israel. And there is a, a big sports university called the Wingate Institute in Israel named after him. Uh, I think there's hardly any Israeli who, who had, haven't been there. I mean, all of us have visited there. And some of us many a time, I underwent a gym instructor's course there. Um, Avi had probably gotten a multitude of certifications at that place. Uh, they teach Krav Maga there. They, there's a lot of stuff going on. It's a famous international institution. Anyhow, the Palmach was torn between, on one hand, they owed the British because the British were providing them with supplies and training and basically help them become what they intended to be, which is a protection organization for the Jewish people of Israel. Uh, on the other hand, within itself, the, the primarily ideology of the Palmach was the protection of the Jewish people and not working for the British. So there is this aspect of the Palmach that yes, they, they've, like Avi said, uh, they've done a lot of dirty jobs for the British promoting their imperial aspirations in the Middle East. Nowadays, we see nations like Russia and the United States meddling in Middle Eastern affairs over oil and other resources. Back in the day, the key players were the Ottoman Empire and later uh, taken as the Middle East was taken over in the First World War became more the, uh, the British and the French, who also created the, the current uh, state borders for all of the Middle Eastern nations we know today. 
uh, that includes Saudi Arabia, Syria, when it was still a state, Lebanon, Israel, Jordan, etc. So the situation is, is complex and what happened was over time, some of the members in the Palmach did not see eye to eye with helping the British because the British mandate for a long time was also preventing the state of Israel from being established and making it difficult for Jews to promote their national goals. And uh, some of these people also felt that they should be somewhat um, more cruel and less, um, how should they say, it? less kind in the manner in which they carry their uh, their violent actions. So but the, the Palmach had some reservations. The Palmach, as, as much as they could, they wouldn't hurt civilians, women, children, and the elderly. But then some people within the organization felt that, you know what, if we are going to rebuild an, a national homeland for the Jewish people that they haven't had in 2,000 years, we need to, to take some harsher measures and if people need to get hurt for that to happen, and then so be it. And so um, various groups split from the Palmach and created other organizations like uh, Etzel and like Le the Lehi, which were more aggressive in pursuing their ideologies in terms of what they believed was good for the Jewish people. They were quite similar to the Palmach but to the extent that they're willing to go to pursue those goals, they were extremists. So uh, there are a lot of critics these, day, critics these days that say uh, that all of these organizations were basically terrorist organizations. Um, it's not entirely accurate, first of all, because uh, the Palmach and, and others were supported by the British directly, uh, by the British military and the British crown, and everybody knew what they're, for, of a lot of what they were up to. And secondly, because they did not act like terrorist organization. A terrorist organizations do not distinguish between their, their victims. And the Palmach, however, did attempt to uh, conserve a certain uh, moral character and a moral compass. Uh, this was not always true for the other smaller organizations that had split from it. So uh, yes, it's, it's a complex sort of uh, scenery back then, the early 20th century, and, and that's how it was. And these were uh, the organizations within which much of what became known as Kapap was developed. So, Avi, please do, do continue. Yeah, th this is a very confusing uh, history, and actually it was not one side. Like you mentioned, there were a lot of groups. You know, my, my good friend, his father used to take me and him to plant a avocado tree. And he just passed away like uh, three weeks ago. And then I found out that his father, I knew he's always a part of the Etzel. He was a part of Jabotinsky and all of those famous people. But he was kidnapped by the Agana, for example, and tortured. So, you know, like even in between the groups in Israel, they were like uh, snitching and fighting. I would say similar to the uh, organization in Krav Maga, who don't like each other many times. But, uh, that, that's why to, to present uh, anything, you always have group. It, it's no matter if it's uh, political groups, these groups. And I, I prefer to go back to the uh, martial arts. And actually, this martial art uh, started to develop. And uh, I will say that with the time, there was no need anymore to fight with a stick. Israel was already established in a country in 1948. And in 1965, it's not a long uh, years from it. It's maybe, uh, you know, 1965 is only seven years after Israel is still established as a country. So in the military dictionary, it was only Kapap. The definition for Krav Maga still not exist. But uh, I would I just, say uh, that... Avi, I would like to, to comment on what you said just now. So we're talking about uh, axes, knives, and sticks uh, being prevalent in the fighting that was going on between different groups in Israel in the early 20th century. But what happened was that towards the later, 90, the later 1940s, 
the country was being uh, swarmed with a lot of firearms. Uh, partly as the Second World War ended in 1945, and there were just there was just quite a lot of weaponry uh, in Europe, and not much that could be done with it because the, the war was was a huge affair, and now almost nobody was fighting. But what can you do with all of those weapons? Are you just going to stockpile them? Well, if you're smart, you're going to sell them to someone. But who, right? So they were looking for people to sell those weapons to, and the Jews were eager to buy them, and the various Arab nations also bought them and also provided them to different paramilitary Arab groups within Israel. So everybody was getting firearms, and this is why uh, fighting with axes, knives, and sticks became less relevant. I just wanted to give that background. Yeah, the more also the army was established, people start to, I mean, like if you look for 1948 uh, war, people didn't have the one kind of uniform, one kind of weapon. But the more the army establishes the army, more regulations get in, more uniform getting in, more dressing code, and more the use of the weapon. And that's where the necessity of maybe kapap start to be changed into okay we need a hand-to-hand -hand program we don't need a, a, a program with sticks with knives with uh, grenades uh, weapon and uh, the army teach maybe the shooting but now we need uh, a clean cut of hand-to-hand -hand system and i think that's where the club guy and i i think it's a guy named uh, moshe finkel i'm not sure that start to change the name Nobody still know who changed really the name to be Krav Maga in the army. But, uh, you know, uh, at that time, I don't know if somebody was uh, really trying to, to create that we can study it. It just established with a dynamic. But I will say that uh, around the 70s, I think Krav Maga started to be known as the army hand-to-hand -hand system still parallel with Kapap and slowly, like young generation, even when I, in 2000, called myself Kapap, Kramagda, people didn't know what is Kapap. But it's funny because people in my father's age knew Kapap, but they, they didn't know what is Kramagda. Hmm. So, you know, it's a new term. Like my father didn't know what is Kramagda, but he knew Kapap. And the young people didn't know what is Kapap, but they knew Kramagda. It's similar like how in China, they use certain terms in the martial arts and, and uh, bodily practices now that just did not exist centuries ago and people are not aware of this. For instance, this term Qigong or Qigong is it's sometimes called in the West. Qigong is a very modern term. It's a 20th century term. You don't see this, this term Qigong in the 19th century or even the early 20th century. Nobody was calling what they did Qigong. They just had different names. So within, like Avi says, within the span of one generation, people can know something by an entirely different name and be unaware it was called something else before. And exactly. okay, so what you were, Avi was talking about the Krav Maga becoming the, the brand name for what they they taught as hand-to-hand -hand combat in the IDF uh, beginning in the 70s. But actually, you, you said the Krav Maga system, but it wasn't really a system, right? No. Even today, I don't think it's still a system because, you know, uh, I don't talk about my time. My time, for sure, it was not one system. Now, politically, some organization tried to put their hands and to create it that it will have you know, track to them because more, le more like politically, uh, you know, to be I'm Mr. Krav Maga and not the others. But I will say that even in my time, if I teach for the Yamam Krav Maga, it had nothing to do with the Krav Maga of Mr. X in this unit or another unit. So uh, that's why I think also in the army, if you teach, for example, Krav Maga in X, but suddenly somebody build a new unit, he didn't follow because I have a lot of friends that you know they coming from jujitsu or from 
Thai box, and they teach Krav Maga in the army, even without being a Krav Maga instructor, because their units, so that they know to fight, and they say, hey, I want you to teach to, my, to, to our guys to fight. And, uh, yeah, so and, let's, uh, uh, let, let's provide the listeners an idea of how that works. The IDF, first of all, the IDF is a bigger brand than Krav Maga itself. So a lot of Krav Maga organizations in Israel would have loved their Krav Maga, their version of it, to become mm -hmm. the sole version taught by the IDF. And a lot of people have tried uh, to pull off connections and, and political favors to make sure that this is what happens. But the IDF and, and Israeli society are so chaotic that even these people were were not successful uh and there there's actually quite a lot there are actually quite a lot of things called krav maga in the, ID, in the idf to this day and what happens is you have various brigades and units uh could be regular infantry could be special forces um could just simply be you know um army intelligence that still go through a very simplistic infantry-like boot camps that's just so that they know how to uh, to shoot a rifle to throw a grenade just in case they, they need to be recruited in an emergency in a war and in each of these different brigades and units you see slightly different or very different type of Krav Maga and what happens is Israelis reach the age of 16 to 17 and they would get a letter from the IDF uh, telling them that their service is up and coming. Because in Israel to this day, men serve for roughly three years. That's their mandatory service. And women serve from for uh, roughly two years. And inter interestingly enough, uh, you don't see any feminists going around saying, oh, you know, men and women should just serve the, the, sa the same length, right? And so suddenly feminism is gone. Women uh, enjoy... The privilege of serving for less time i mean it's all right I'm, I'm, this is not a statement against feminism just saying uh equal rights until just benefits right so anyhow when they receive this letter uh those young israelis are invited to come to all sorts of army bases and undergo tests and interviews to see which kind of job they're best suited to in the IDF. Now, oftentimes the IDF is, is quite terrible at sorting these people out for the right kind of job. And quite a large, quite a large percentage of those, um, how do you say Malshabi? <laughs> those uh, candidates for service, uh, they're called, uh, quite a lot of them end up with, with jobs that they hate or that are poorly suited for their skills, character, intelligence, etc. But a lot of them do get a job that sort of fits who they are and what they're about. And some, some of these tests uh, can be quite sophisticated and, and take a long time. I mean, if, if they want to test these people out to be fighter pilots or special forces infantry and such, uh, they might be invited to and they were special training camps that would last uh, a week or even more to see if uh, they're up to standard or be invited to several separate days or clusters of days to, to be tested. But what happens with Krav Maga is, is not all as complicated. What happens is that when they're questioned in their interviews, these people are typically asked about their hobbies and their background. And among those who say that they've been into the martial arts for a while and that they have black belts or equivalent, some of these people might be invited to uh, receive the job of being a Krav Maga instructor. And then they would be enlisted. They would undergo a very short course. If I remember correctly, it's like it's a three month course in which uh, they would be introduced to the Krav Maga curriculum taught in whichever brigade or unit that they would work with and they become certified Krav Maga instructors by the IDF within three months time which is quite ridiculous and, and of course the IDF assumes that they know something because 
they've been the martial arts for a while, but having a black belt doesn't mean that you know anything, as we all know. And then they end up, after this free, short three month course, uh, teaching Krav Maga for two or three years, because sometimes the Krav Maga instructors are women, and they would serve for, for two years, not three. And then they go out uh, to civilian life. Some of them, uh, most of them just forget about it and go about doing something else. Some of them actually open Krav Maga schools and they say, oh, I'm a certified Krav Maga instructor by the IDF. Of course, I have my, here, here's my diploma. And because there's, there isn't much regulation on the martial arts in Israel, well, ba basically anybody can claim that and teach whatever they like. And that's the situation with Krav Maga in the IDF in the manner in which you know, people are sorted for the job of a Krav Maga instructor and the chaotic nature of the profession. Uh, Avi, going back to you. Well, you know, like you, you mentioned something that it was even, I don't know what's going on today, you know, I'm not living now in Israel, but uh, I can tell you that uh, Jim Wagner, uh, reality-based, he asked me to introduce him in the Krav Maga and I took him to Winge to see the military Krav Maga. Just, just a moment, so who is, who, who is this guy, Jim Wagner? Jim Wagner is the guy that used to write for Black Belt magazine and Buddha mm. magazine about martial arts. And uh, one day he visited Israel and he asked me as a friend if I can introduce him in Wingate. And uh, I took him to the military uh, base in Wingate and I took him to the Krav Maga and he was in a shock because there was a very small table, like a high school table with two wood, uh, simple, you know, like uh, when you go to high school chairs. And even we've been like four people at that moment, there were not enough chairs in the office of the headquarters of Krav Maga. <laughs> and there were like uh, two soldiers that are, uh, there was one soldier which is uh, actually uh, NCO, non-commissioned officer, is like uh, Keva. And there were like two soldiers that uh, just Jobnik, what we call, they did uh, basic uh, training, very basic, and they serve in that military base in the Krav Maga. And he was in a shock because he thought, you know, the whole Israeli army is doing Krav Maga. And this. So Krav Maga also in the army had the good times and the bad times, I would say. There were times, I think around the 80s, when Krav Maga got more exposed and budget and more big. And there were times like a lot of commanders said, we don't need this. And, you know, like uh, there were a lot of situation in the Lotal school in the army. It's L some kind Lotar of... Lotal uh, is, is, is general term for counterterrorism in the IDF. Yeah, but it's not a serious one without insulting. You do in boot camp for any uh, infantry and then you go to Lotal. So it's still very beginning school, you know, it's like just after your boot camp. And uh, they used to abuse soldier and a lot of soldiers uh, finish their almost handicapped with the broken ribs, uh, lose of testicle, losing of kidney. All the, almost all the Lotal school was closed. Uh, my friend was uh, the doctor of this and they had a terrible problem with uh, I will say unserious instructor that uh, used to injury, you know, they were kids, they just 18, maybe 18 and a half joined the army. And then it was a big issue in the news. They closed the Lotar school, sent the instructor to prison, military prison, some people for six months for abusing soldiers because uh, they used to beat them up for no need and, and doing a lot of uh, unnecessary, unprofessional training on the name of teaching them for counterterrorism. Yeah, and, well, so um, I mean, just just to comment here because I experienced similar things. I started my service in the Golani Infantry Brigade, and inter interestingly enough, we weren't abused in the Krav Maga classes, but we were abused otherwise <laughs> throughout the day, every day. And what happens is, like Avi says, they take those kids; they're eighteen, eighteen and a half, nineteen. And they might teach them skills, but you can't teach them character and morality because they have to bring that from home. And those kids, uh, eventually, when they're just 19, 19 and a half, 20 years old, and they get to command other kids just a year, year and a half younger than themselves. 
and they get this absolute power over these other just slightly younger kids because they are in the brigade training facilities typically far away from a settlement the nearest settlement they are not supervised they're not monitored they're not on camera they're not being recorded they could do anything almost anything that they could possibly want or imagine to these soldiers under their command and it is very likely to this day that nobody is going to complain nobody is going to know and they can be quite abusive they they can be abusive to the point of serious physical injury uh, my when when i enlisted my platoon had 150 people when we finished infantry boot camp from 150 people we were down to 50 and most of those 100 people who quit had to quit because of medical conditions due to either physical abuse or improper training now they did want to end up with 50 anyway because they only needed that platoon to have 50 people by the end of the boot camp to continue to more advanced training but the way they you know weeded them out so to speak was very abusive because there was just no there were no supervising adults like the oldest person that might look at what was going on was i don't know 22 23 year old officer uh that's not a serious that's not serious adult supervision you know even though you take things more seriously because it's it's like it's life and death situations and you're you're handling firearms and grenades and and whatnot but still i mean these so what happens is like avi says they, they go into these krav maga classes and it's worse there because they, they need to teach hand-to-hand -hand combat and these people ba are basically given groups of 20 to 40 dummies training dummies and these are real human beings and they can hit them as hard as they want with no repercussions most of the time nobody's gonna even the brigade doctor is not likely to to snitch to say anything uh so what avi was saying is i mean it's welcome it's good that you know one one case is such one period is such was these people were caught and trialed and, and put in prison but it, it, it happens frequently maybe not as as bad as the incident that avi was describing but ha still happens frequently and these people escape justice and it's just the nature of what's going on because of the age group because they don't teach morality they just give them skills to work with because there's no adult supervision etc etc and we, we have to remember the idf is a volunteer military it's still based i mean it's its strength is uh, founded on the fact that it's made out of the general citizenry and people volunteer really if you really really don't want to serve there are many ways to escape service it's a volunteer military in the sense it's not a professional military like the u.s military and there's a big difference they would arguably fight better because they fight for their country but really fight for the, they're fighting for their country in the sense of if they lose their country would be destroyed in that sense they fight for their country so that makes them stronger it makes us stronger as a military the idf but at the same time because they're not a professional military then the standards of professionalism are much lower than what you see in the german military in the, uh, in the marines for instance in the, the u.s army etc okay Avi, please continue so i will say that uh, those incidents mostly around the 80s to the yeah i will say the 80s uh, to the middle between uh, before the 90s they were the most terrible for krav maga because uh, there was a race of krav maga at that time until those injuries mostly at the lotal school when uh, they work really unprofessional and too many people they will never you know like it's the people that uh, you expect them to go later on for good units and i can tell you that even today 
I, I'm not sure maybe today today, but I remember that units like Sayeret Matkal will not send their soldiers to Lothar school because of this the, the disrespect. You know, you you monitor, you test people in the gibush, in the recruiting, and then you send them to infantry school, then you send them to jump school, to parachuters, and then they go to the Lothar school and the guys that you choose, one broke a leg, one broke the, and you know, it, it means in the army, this guy's finished. He can never keep going on his, uh, on his way to be a part of a special force. So, so what, what Avi is talking about, basically, the army is putting quite a lot of effort to build up those special, force, special forces teams. Uh, he mentioned Sayeret Matkal. Sayeret Matkal is like a Delta Force or Green Berets. And a very highly specialized, famous uh, special forces unit in Israel. And they're trying to build them into these small coherent teams of very professional, highly skilled individuals that can basically do anything. You can drop them anywhere on the globe and they would manage the situation. But what happens was, it, what happens is that the, the IDF would put them through all of these different training camps and courses and, and they're, they're basically on a production line to become the best special forces soldier that the IDF could possibly produce. And on the production line, they, they go through all of these stages. And then what obviously is like these people would eventually running that production line, they would get to the Lothar school. And in that school, they might be abused by their instructors, break a leg, get some other type of injury. And that would take them off that production line and they can't put them back because the time it would take them to recover by that time they would already have to put someone else in that team and build it differently they can't wait the IDF because of its security needs cannot wait for six months until that soldier is fully operational again so I think that time that uh, Lothar exploded all over the Israeli news, mostly because uh, there was a training when uh, one of the minister or governmental uh, mom, her son was one of the guys that injury, I don't remember if he lost a testicle or a kidney, and when they came to the hospital, they wanted to know what happened. And then all this situation in Lothar school, uh, which we call Unit 700, 707, Sorry. So Unit 707, which is, is the Lothar, that's where it came to the news. Commanders got their, you know, kicked out from the army and the instructor went to prison. And that, I will say, hit the Krav Maga the most when the army said, no, thank you. We don't want, these people need to, to, to fight, you know, like with weapon. And if they can uh, injury in the hand-to-hand, -hand, we don't need hand-to-hand. And I will say that uh, it took a long time before the, the school Lothar start to gain again respect. And then, you know, <laughs> they were again in the news. I don't know if you remember when some kind of a Lothar uh, commander, he allowed Bar Mitzvah, uh, Jewish, uh, rich Jewish from the U.S. come to do Bar Mitzvah to his son in the Lothar, in the army, when the soldiers need to be like the butler and to serve the food like catering <laughs> and everything because that guy is, a, is giving donation and that again uh, you know it's all depend on commanders if there were tomorrow a new commander for example for the military sports center and he think Krav Maga is important Krav Maga will blossom again if there is an instructor that have a bad impression about Krav Maga because you know injuries or whatever he will say, I don't want it at all, or you will uh, limit it to maximum. Yeah, so it will really depend on... Yeah, to, comment on what Avi, to comment on what Avi was saying uh, about those uh, rich Jews, especially from the United States, what happens is the Jewish people are very supportive of one another. And it, it is a long-standing tradition for Jews who live in countries outside of the land of Israel to donate money for Jewish causes in Israel. Uh, it's been a tradition for uh, 
probably at least 150 years. So a lot of good willing Jewish people from Europe and mostly Europe and the United States, sometimes Australia, even New Zealand, uh, would donate a lot of money to Jewish causes and often to the IDF. And they would buy all sorts of stuff. Uh, they might contribute, um, they, they might build uh, a basketball court for a brigade. They might buy the clothing, the, just the everyday clothing for all of the soldiers for several brigades. Uh, they might put up festivities. Um, they, they might build a, a rec an entire recreation facility with swimming pools and spas and such for soldiers, all sorts of stuff like that. But what happens is that often specific commanders in the IDF would feel that they owe those rich Jewish people because of their donations. Or at times a minority among those rich Jewish people would demand that the IDF you know, show some respect, uh, so show some appreciation. We just gave you $10 million, you know, dude, dude, make, make something happen. They might just say it or they would, might makes very specific demands. So unfortunately to this day, it's very common and under the radar, it has to, to happen unofficially because uh, if, it, if it gets out to the Israeli media, then people would become furious. But, but I'm telling you, it's still, it's still happening. Uh, they would bring their families and sometimes kids and friends and they might have the bar mitzvahs, uh, special uh, religious celebratory, uh, 13th birthdays for, um, for boys or bat mitzvahs, that's the uh, 12th birthday for girls. And they might have them on military bases. Uh, they might have that, that um, donor or uh, his, or, his or her family um, going on rides in uh, fighter, fighter jets or tanks or take them on boats and make a show for them. And when this is going on, I mean, the, first of all, the IDF is going to spend some of the donation money for that big show. Because as you know, um, operating a military costs a lot. I mean, every, every shell a tank, a tank shoots, uh, that's a lot of money. Uh, every, every ride on the plane, uh, just, just a fuel, that's a lot of money. So the IDF is going to use some of the donation or some, at times money from elsewhere, from um, IDF budget to uh, give those rich Jews and their families a good time. And they, they would do all sorts of things which are shady or sometimes even just outright illegal, uh, but that's their manner of showing respect and appreciation to those rich donors, and that, that's how it goes. I mean, they, they want those donations. Uh, that's partly how they get them. Well, you talk about illegal, and that makes a smile on me, because uh, if you look YouTube, if you look YouTube, you see some guys that came, you know, just for two hours in the in the army, mostly in the Lotal school again, and they know somebody over there. And the guy say, okay, join. And the guy load himself in this day with uh, pictures and videos. And now he's official instructor of the Lotar and, <laughs> you know, for marketing. On the same time, I see Israeli soldiers that serving now maybe as a Krav Maga, and they're already uh, preparing themselves to be the new grandmaster in the market. And instead of serving, like I served in the army, I don't have a lot of even pictures in the army, but now with a cellular, it's so easy. And everyone uh, taking pictures in the military facilities, which means crime. And when I see Israeli uh, soldiers uh, dressing themselves officially uniform and they posting it on YouTube, like, look at me, I'm the, I'm the guy that you're looking, I'm the Krav Maga instructor that you're looking. I'm, I'm, it's funny, it's sad, but I think it's also taking the Krav Maga out of the proportion and, and the needs that it really needs. Because a lot of young uh, kids, I call them, they're taking themselves, and they show already bad attitude, because military, you cannot film in a military facility. It's a crime. And when the guy film himself and picture himself giving classes all the time. It's a, you know, I don't have good things to say about this unless you get permission. And that's very difficult as you know to get. But now we're getting actually to what we see every day. It's a competition 
and you can hear is this guy is legit so first everyone is legit you know it's like are, are you legit human yeah of course you are legit are you legit in uh, kung fu everyone is legit it depends what you like and and this is a little bit to go back to the krav maga because uh, you know like there's so many things involved when you come to krav maga from politics from israel as a country but i will say that uh, it's about time to separate military krav maga from the civilian krav maga and it's a totally wrong to say krav maga is the official system of the israeli army because the israeli army don't share with you the curriculum it will be stupid of the army to share its curriculum it's like uh, i will not share things that the army using with civilians so i think that uh, we have to see krav maga as a civilian that it's a lot of civilians that uh, teaching by ex krav maga instructors that many times even as me i tell my soldiers or i tell my students that's what i teach to my soldiers that's what i'm not not what i'm going to teach to you because it's a totally mistake so, and, so you, uh, you just raised a, a very interesting point and i'd like to draw a comparison here we have the United States Marine Corps and they have their, their own martial art called MCMAP, uh, M-C-M-A-P. And MCMAP is far better organized and structured than Krav Maga is in the IDF. MCMAP has a, a specific curriculum that's clear. There is a manual for the MCMAP curriculum. It has ranks, it even has belts. And it has a, a very, specific number of techniques there is an order in which those techniques are taught there is a manner in which they're taught very orderly but the marine corps also puts out that um micmap manual and even videos countless videos of its soldiers practicing that martial art and and what's in the manual and it's out in the open people can see that people can study what those Marines are learning to apply in hand-to-hand -hand combat. And obviously since they was just saying, well, if you are military, why would you want everyone to know exactly what you're teaching your soldiers? That might not be the best idea. So I think it's, very, it's a very interesting comment. It also speaks to the difference between the IDF and the, the U.S. military, whether it be the, the uh, U.S. Army or the Marines, because I think the United States is dealing with so many different types of threats and is active all over the world that it does not think uh, in the confines of we have a, a specific enemy and that enemy is going to train specifically to defeat our very specific methods. Although, from what I've heard, there is a precedent to it of um, American Special Forces being trained to specifically counter hand-to-hand -hand methods uh, used by the Spetsnaz, by the Russians, and likewise the Spetsnaz learning how to counter the American hand-to-hand -hand methods. So that's very interesting. However, in Israel, since the, the land of Israel is such, a, I mean, it's a relatively small landmass, it's the state of Israel is the size of New Jersey, roughly. Um, and this, this area is so small that word gets around and it's very easy for uh, Israel's potential enemies to pick up on what the IDF is doing and prepare for it. So the IDF, I think relative to many other militaries, is attempts to be more secretive. And in many ways it does manage to be. However, like Avi also suggested prior, they have a difficulty nowadays controlling the media onslaught because of all the cell phones that almost every soldier has got an advanced cell phone in their hands and they're taking pictures and videos all the time. And it's very difficult to monitor all of them. And again, it's a volunteer, volunteer military. It's not a professional military. So it's somewhat different. And they're not, I mean, you can threaten a soldier with a month in military prison or two months or whatever, but it's not like threatening 
uh, a Marine with taking away his salary, which, which can get to, to, to a significant number, and then him not being able to feed his family. And, and the Marine might be in his late 20s, early 30s, maybe early 40s, uh, was the you know, typical Israeli soldier is somewhere between the age of 18 and 25. That's not the same. And additionally, uh, those soldiers, I mean, when, during their mandatory service, they, they make ridiculously low sums of money. When I was a soldier, I made the equivalent of l less than 100 US dollars per month. I was basically a slave for all intents and purposes. And even when you, if you sign up to continue being a soldier, uh, as a career soldier past those three mandatory uh, years, still, I mean, un until you get higher up in rank, your, your salary is just so-so. You get a very good pension, but your salary is, is not, it's not that good relative to the amount of time and effort you're putting. So moving on with something that uh, Avi was beginning to talk about, that there is a big difference between what we call Krav Maga in the IDF and Krav Maga in civilian life, uh, which are two things we, that, that had actually developed in parallel. So Avi, let, talk a little bit about that. When, when you see kids program Krav Maga, that's immediately cut, uh, that we must cut two kinds of Krav Maga. You cannot have Krav Maga for kids and claim that this is the official system of the army. I mean, my parents would never start send me to study something like this. Uh, my parents will want to send me something that is more like a sport for, for you know, physical education and uh, with a control. They don't want me to be, you know, like coming and stabbing somebody. So when we talked about Krav Kids and Kids program, I will say that here we stop. There is no any more Krav Maga of the army. It's a Krav Maga developed for civilians. Also, if you mention Marines or many times soldiers, they're in the best years. They're very young, they're very strong, they're very aggressive, full of testosterone. Plus a lot of the technique, I have a malfunction, I stick my weapon in your face. Uh, you know, so I would say that the Krav Maga from the military will force us anyway to change when we're going to Krav Maga in civilian life. The soldier, in my time, Krav Maga instructor program was one month, then one and a half months. Maybe today they have two months. It's still a joke because a lot of time it were people with no background in any martial art. Now, you can take a person with no background in martial art to achieve any secret martial art that you want. A guy that's doing Muay Thai or Jiu Jitsu, in a one strike will knock him down. That's what happened many times in Krav Maga instructors in the army. We used to call it Krav Maga, the Israeli national joke. Because uh, if you come from boxing, Thai boxing, how that guy, he trained maximum two months, can, can last against you. Krav Maga is a uh, martial art, I would say. It's not like sport. It's not only muscle. It's also the, the power and the strength of the bones and to develop strong bones it takes years when you see thai boxer their bones are built by years of striking and it's not something that you can take somebody and after two months he will be able to do it properly so this is where i think it's the benefit actually to take the krav maga from the army and to put it in another level the, take the concept take the good things and keep develop it with uh, more techniques, more knowledge, and more skills, and more developments. And this is actually where I see Krav Maga civilian, which we have a chance to take the ideas and develop it for kids program, and develop it maybe to civilians, which can be overweight, can have heart problems, can have a lot of medical problems, it's not built only to, you know, like a, a, a strong Marines or an MMA fighter. So I think that the civilian um, uh, way for Krav Maga must, and also I, I can see it every day, it's different. And uh, 
This is where uh, I see a grandmaster coming from the army and he's only 24 and he does some show off videos and show off uh, videos he film actually illegally in the army to marketing himself. That's not something I will be involved with because uh, I'm more interested to see Krav Maga for civilians that uh, um, people can do it and without injury. It's not built uh, for ninja. It's not built for somebody that is very athletic. And that's where we actually coming back to uh, how I see Krav Maga. I see it as uh, more friendly civilians. And when I hear people say, oh, Krav Maga is not martial art. Okay, what it is if it's not martial art? What? Thai box is not a martial art. It's less brutal. So all of this ego, you know, like that Krav Maga sometimes bring, if we put it aside and we stop marketing by ego and more with a humanitarian and more with a friendship and more with uh, the benefits of uh, martial art, we will get a better Krav Maga. I will say that... Uh, we see, um, I call it the, the military level. So we, we've been talking smack about lots of the Krav Maga scene in the IDF. I just want to be clear that not all of the Krav Maga in the IDF is terrible. Some is quite good, but it depends in, what, which, which, which unit you're in. I mean, most of the special forces units are getting decent Krav Maga training, if not very, very good training. And it really depends on who's the instructor, what's their background, and what's the specific curriculum taught in that specific unit. I've known uh, quite a lot of people who came out of the, the IDF and have been long-term instructors who are very good martial artists. It's just a matter of what's being taught where. And throughout most of the IDF, um, it's low level because they, they just take low level individuals and also, as they don't really have much time to teach those people. Uh, when I was in the Golani Infantry Brigade, I can't recall exactly how many Krav Maga classes we had in boot camp, but probably less than 30. Probably less than 30, maybe as little as 20. Now imagine that you were a novice martial artist and you had to go study a martial art whichever martial art you want doesn't matter it could be western boxing muay thai it could be a style of karate it could be chinese internal martial arts uh mma you name it you only had 20 classes how much skill could you possibly get in 20 classes also given that because you're an, an infantryman then you're going to spend most of your time shooting at the ranges cleaning your weapons, running around, and doing strength training, and eating, cleaning. I mean, your, your day is just so packed with activities. And what I want to talk about eating and cleaning, you know, so oftentimes they have to make their own food from scratch and they have to, to clean the, the entire, like the entire set of buildings that they live in in the brigade. And you're, you're basically, you're your own, often your own chef, your own janitor, uh, your, 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 fit, your own fitness coach. You have to do so much stuff every day that you don't really have the time left to practice hand-to-hand -hand martial arts. It's just not going to happen. The, when you have the, the remaining like 30 to 60 minutes a day to do something else throughout your training, you just use it to, to chill, to... to to speak with your friends, call your family, call your girlfriend, or just get another hour of sleeping. You're not going to use it to do more physical training. You have enough of that. So oftentimes what happens, if you get 20 to 30 hours of Krav Maga, these are likely the only 20 to 30 hours of martial arts training that you would get for the next three years. That's not a lot. And that's not quality training, unfortunately. Now, what happened was that Avi was talking about those people who started Krav Maga back in the 30s and their Krav Maga was taught both to soldiers and organizations that eventually became the IDF and also to uh, civilians or then some of those soldiers went out to, they, they came out to civilian life from the IDF or those organizations and but they 
still knew their Krav Maga and maybe they continued to teach it or they taught it to their children or they opened the school. So in parallel to the Krav Maga of the IDF, they had developed many streams and schools of Krav Maga outside of the IDF. Now we also uh, have a lot of schools that weren't Krav Maga related at all, but called themselves Krav Maga, we'll get to that. But I want to go back all the way to the 1930s. We, we just mentioned those sticks and, and knives and axes. Could you tell us, Avi, like what, what is this Krav Maga, what was it made of? Like did, did they just make up techniques or did they take those techniques and methods from elsewhere, such as judo, for instance, because Moshe Feldenkrais was a judo teacher. Yes, you have uh, Yuda Malkus, for example, is also jiu-jitsu and judo. Um, you have Gershon Kupler, you have uh, a lot of names in history. You have people that teach, uh, brought boxing into the... But again, you know, when you talk about boxing, uh, you know, like when you look for the 90, 20, 90, 30 boxing, <laughs> you know, it's not like boxing developed today at that time. Um, so the people, for example, teach a little bit boxing, a little bit judo, a little bit jujitsu. I will say Thai box is much more later in the 80s, just get into Israel and got involved in the army, in the Krav Maga program. But the, the, the start of the Krav Maga starts from uh, uh, a few things. I will say old manual books from the uh, Second World War, maybe first even uh, World War, all of those things of uh, sentry removal, you know, pulling the, the the helmet and uh, slattering, you know, those things start like the cap up, all the manual book come from uh, uh, World War and uh, maybe a uh, firebrand, maybe uh, Sykes firebrand and maybe later on a little bit from Colonel Applegate, uh, all of those manual books of uh, old CQB schools from different army, different emigrant that uh, came to Israel and each each one of them uh, teach different uh, manual uh, manual book that he knew or, or different skills and and it's still developed today I will say today suddenly um, the old Gracie, Gracie Mania and suddenly you see ground fight in BJJ uh, in, in uh, Krav Maga and actually it's BJJ so I remember my conversation with uh, one of the main leaders of Krav Maga and one of the main uh, also head of Krav Maga in, uh, in the military, uh, Elia Vixar, rest in peace. And I remember me and him talking and I asked him, Eli, why you don't teach Krav Maga um, ground fight? Because at that time I used to teach already Jiu Jitsu and ground fight. And he said to me, uh, because in Krav Maga concept, if you got yourself to the ground, fight is over. And I will smile and say, but tell me, never give up. What do you mean if you go to the ground? But I think that a lot of the teachers, maybe it also can happen to me. You know, the more you get old, you're afraid to stay, you know, always student, sometimes teacher. We become teacher, we have curriculum, and that's it. And that's where you're losing Krav Maga. When people tell me, Avi, give me curriculum, I say, this is a temporary curriculum. I think the biggest advantage of Krav Maga the, that it can progress and all of those guys that says we are Krav Maga only of this and uh, this were our God and this is the Bible he gave us and that's it they don't want to progress and even they're afraid to progress in front of the students so instead of going study properly uh, BJJ they will take two DVDs and they will make something really ridiculous on the ground that it, you know, somebody no ground fight, you will just laugh. And I think that this is the fear of evolve. And when you fear of evolve, you stop doing Krav Maga. Because if you look karate, you don't want to involve. This is the karate and that's it. If you're doing uh, many systems, that's the manual book. The advantage that Krav Maga had, and I don't call it anymore Krav Maga, I call it PMA, practical martial art, is to study from everyone. And if right now we're exposed to something we didn't know, like ground fight. So I go and I start from white belt, blue belt, purple belt, brown belt to black belt. And I explore what is BJJ, not from videos. I explore it on my body. 
I, I explore it by sparring, by rolling. Now when I know, I add it into my curriculum. It's not just to go and do boxing, because um, in the street we don't have gloves. So I can explore boxing, but then I have to put it in the concept of Krav Maga. So this is where Krav Maga has a big advantage of evolve. But to evolve, you also have to study. And a lot of Krav Maga, they don't want to study. They just want to teach, have a curriculum, and that's where they they will lose in the in the battle because uh, every day we have to study something and uh, for example what we put we put survival we put so many different skill evacuation you are with handcuffs you you've been kidnapped how you escape how you survive so i will say that uh, for me krav maga is evolved system and uh, if you don't do it you don't do krav maga that's for me the difference that uh, people that are so stubborn that this is the only thing in Krav Maga, then in actually they don't do any more Krav Maga because they're doing a very bad variation of karate. And, uh, you know, like, I know also the history. Uh, I know, like, in Krav Maga, all of those release. They're coming actually from Kata Sci-Fi Karate, Goju Ryu. Um, Eli Avixar come from Netanya. Yuda Pantanovich, rest in peace, all of them, yes? used to do Goju Ryu. And many times they counter, they've been friends, they ask him question, oh, why are you doing this in the kata? And he say, okay, hold my hand. And then he release. So many times the people even do not understand the real uh, reason. And I give you a story. You, you saw my cat coming and disturb me when I'm talking. In the Zen temple, the cat used to bugging the students in the meditation. So the master used to tell to his senior student, to put to lock the cat in the kitchen when they meditate in the afternoon and uh, many years pass and uh, the master died the cat uh, died but it was a tradition in the zen temple every time when you meditate to lock a cat in the kitchen nobody understand the reason so sometimes we're doing stuff without understanding and that's where you don't do krav maga for me any move that you cannot explain is not uh, for me a Krav Maga. Any move that don't lead you uh, to with a reason why you do and you have the ability to explain it very simple. Like uh, Einstein said that if you cannot explain it simple to me, it means you still don't understand it. So that's for me Krav Maga or, or call it more than Krav Maga, call it evolved Krav Maga, call it uh, Kapap Krav Maga. But I don't want to fight on names and who's who. I think that uh, for the Krav Maga future is to keep it as evolved system. And if tomorrow will be, I don't know, uh, Krav, uh, some system that I attacking from up with a rope, we have to study it and we have to adjust for it. So if, if you're doing Krav Maga and you don't adjust for ground fight, you don't do Krav Maga. If you do Krav Maga and you don't adjust, but you have to fight with a Kali guy, you don't do Krav Maga. That's why I went and I studied so many martial arts, but I didn't study for one week. I studied Filipino martial art to be a guru. I studied Japanese martial art for different titles and different levels, and I keep studying. For me, this is Krav Maga. And when you talk to the old concept of Krav Maga, was to study Krav Maga, but also always to practice, either in karate, either in judo, either in jiu-jitsu, and to keep evolved. And I think this is uh, the main answer for me for Krav Maga. So I think uh, what Avi is basically saying, that those early founders uh, in, in whose footsteps he follows still today, created Krav Maga as a sort of a self-defense oriented MMA. Krav Maga was MMA much, much before, decades earlier uh, than the UFC. But, and it wasn't tested in the octagon. It was tested on the actual battlefields of the Middle East. In part, of course, because a lot of it was civilian and not all of it was tested. That's just the nature of things. Now, Avi speaks to the Israeli spirit. It's the spirit of improvisation innovation and originality 
And for Israelis, it's very difficult to keep them in a box. They don't like to be boxed. They don't like to be caged. And oftentimes they feel that they are being hindered by too much structure. And Avi basically says that he feels Krav Maga has to be progressive. It has to change with the times or more so it has to change with one's experience. The more that he gains more knowledge and an experience and hands-on understanding of different martial arts that he, he feels that he's obliged to take from these martial arts and add to his Kapap system, which is essentially a type of Krav Maga. And he says not all Krav Maga instructors do that. A lot of people, in his opinion, uh, would rather just form a curriculum and stick to it for as long as possible because it makes them feel safer or maybe it's a, it's a better business model, better economic model. Uh, so, Avi, I, I, I would like to speak with you about those uh, Krav Maga schools that were not really Krav Maga to begin with. There may be something else, but then at times they are also referred to uh, as Krav Maga. And, and I'll, I'll name two of them. Uh, we have Gadi Kenpo Jutsu and we have Denis Survival. And these very, very odd names, odd sounding names for listeners from abroad who are not familiar with these styles. But Gadi, Gadi is a, a short for Gadiel, that's a, a Hebrew name, my, my own father, his name is Gadi. Gadi Kenpo Jutsu, and Kenpo Jutsu are a Japanese uh, term, terms. Uh, ken is, is, in this context, is fist. Po is in method. Jutsu is technique. So it's basically Gadi's fist method technique. That's the name of the system. And then the other one's called Denis Hisardut or Denis Survival. Uh, after uh, its founder, Dennis, a famous uh, a martial arts teacher in Israel. So, Avi, please tell us a little bit more about those systems, their originators, and, and similar schools in Israel, which many people also commonly refer to as Krav Maga. Okay, I just want to, to do something before. You mentioned, like, uh, curriculum. And I, I come from a school, even for swords in Japan, that my teacher always say that we are like a chef. Everyone put his own spices. And sometimes you go, you know, like to, let's say McDonald's, and everything is a measurement. You know, how much salt you put, what kind of potato you make. I prefer like schools that uh, the test is uh, the original chef, you know, it's not like, uh, okay, take uh, one spoon of this, one glass of that. The, the chef cook with his eyes, he look, he put in, he test, he put a little bit more. It's not something with a measurement, anything. And when you put curriculum, I think that the feedback for the student is a little bit difficult because I always teach with the feedback. I always look for the student and I always look, mm, he need a little bit more salt or this, I need to cook it a little bit more. So I think this is my way, traditionally, I will say ASEAN way to teach. Now, you mentioned two very dear uh, friends. Gadi, uh, rest in peace, Gadi Skornik just passed away. It's uh, one of the biggest uh, lost of the Israeli martial art. An amazing uh, martial artist, Gadi Kempo Jutsu, it's his system. He was one of the top judoka and jiu-jitsu instructor in Israel and then again because he was also lieutenant colonel in the army he was involved with a lot of uh, security forces in Israel um, I, I cannot talk on his behalf but uh, you know that I'm one of his uh, also black belts uh, ranked uh, high level uh, and uh, we've been friends uh, he also helped me many times. I, I had uh, myself surgery and he used to do acupunctures to me. Um, he's a very good friend also of uh, Chaim Peer, which was also involved also as a lieutenant colonel in Kapap. So um, I see everyone, even when we fight, still as a family. I see everyone even when 
we disagree still as a respect. But uh, Gadi was really one of the top judoka with a very famous uh, story from the Holocaust. Uh, as a child, he was uh, hide and grow up actually as a Christian. But uh, he moved to Israel, he was involved a lot in the army. I, I can see him also as a part because he came also, he, he was a joker, he liked to joke. And I remember he came also to my father's funeral and to the Shiva, to the, you know, like to, to all of those things. And um, he has his own uh, system. He gave me his book on the same thing, Dennis Anover which again is uh, one of the greatest master and uh, amazing guy over eight years old, teaching every day, living in the dojo. He live and, 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 and everything is, you know, his life is the dojo. Uh, again, amazing guy. His story many times, again, you can go and interview and ask, but you know, I don't like to talk on their behalf, but I will say that uh, Danny Sanover, and Gadi Skorning are for sure from the pillar of uh, Israeli martial art. I will say that they're also big part of the Krav Maga roots because uh, even, because you know, their sons, uh, Denny's son teaching the army, two sons teaching the army Krav Maga and uh, in the Lotal school. So you cannot say that uh, they are not part also of the development of the Krav Maga or we all, but uh, I think that they have their own method. I see them as a Krav Maga. Even, uh, but you know, again, if you look even for me, you will see it's a triangle or a circle. If you take a triangle and you can draw inside a, a circle and inside the circle you can draw a square. So um, martial art contain all of those geometric, but my triangle is Kapap, Krav Maga, Israeli Jiu Jitsu. Because Moshe Feldenkrais, Ida Marcus, even Gadi Skornik, uh, Denis Sanover, myself, we all got involved with Jiu-Jitsu. When I moved to teach in the army, I didn't teach it under the name Jiu-Jitsu. We teach it as a... So, wait, so, so let's... I, I want to be, before you continue, be specific about two things. First of all, since we talked about uh, Gadi Skornik sensei and Denis Hanover sensei, Gadi, the, the founder of Gadi Ken Projutsu, and uh, Denis Hanover Sensei, founder of Denis Survival. Um, both these people um, survived harsh anti-Semitism. Uh, Gadis Kornik Sensei is a Holocaust survivor who had to, pre uh, to, to be brought up as a Christian to survive as a child. Um, Denis Hanover Sensei, if I'm not mistaken, his story is that he had to deal with a lot of anti-Semitic bullying and violence in South Africa. Right, and it is why his system is also called uh, Dennis Survival, because it's basically geared towards the survival of the Jewish people. That's essentially the core ideology around which he built that style. And with respect to these people and their systems, what 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 happened was that when they created their systems, which integrate lots of stuff, so um, got this Kornick and say is more judo based in his origins and in Sano version say more uh, more based on Kyokushin Kai Karate and then they both drew inspiration from a lot of uh, Kepap and Krav Maga but then later when their systems became more standardized over the decades they themselves as well as their students and grand students and children went on to teach Krav Maga people and teach so-called Krav Maga in the IDF, which was actually their systems, partly based on Krav Maga and partly based on other things. And the second comment I would like to make just for, for one moment before you continue is that when Avi Sensei is speaking of Jujutsu, he's here not talking about traditional Japanese Jujutsu, which he had also studied, is also a teacher of, and especially sword methods. We are talking here specifically about Brazilian Jujutsu, uh, with which Avi Sensei is a black belt under the Machado family. So that's the, when he says that he taught Jiu Jitsu to the IDF, he's talking about Brazilian Jiu Jitsu specifically. No, 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 Japanese. Oh, actually, yeah, really? Japanese. Okay, okay, interesting. Yeah, at that time, 
uh, you know, I used to st to study in Shinki Badojo. It's uh, the main big police dojo. When you have uh, four floors, one floor is for ob observation, the down floor is judo, and then again kendo school, and then the observation. And uh, I used to go every morning to to get my butt kicked. Uh, I, I, well, I which dojo was out. this in? Which, which dojo was this it, in Japan? It's, uh, it's called Shinkiba, Shinkiba Police uh, Main Dojo. So all the instructors, they teach in the Japanese police. They come in there every morning and they have a big practice. Very rough school, very strong uh, teachers. I mean, teachers are eight done. So you can, you know, I was nobody there. <laughs> I'm still nobody there maybe, but uh, it's very, very powerful, uh, strong school. And in this school, they teach kendo, they teach judo, and they teach some kind of a variation of uh, jiu-jitsu and arresting technique. Arresting technique in Japanese is taiho-jitsu. Taiho-jitsu, hoju. Hoju is the uh, arresting technique. So when I came to Israel back in 92, from after many years in Japan, I study, I, I teach kendo. I didn't want to teach anything, not karate, nothing, because there were enough karate schools and I prefer to put my time to, to jujitsu, uh, to kendo. But then I started to teach jujitsu as a, as a side, you know, like when you eat a steak and you get rice. But then my school became one of the leading for jujitsu school in Israel. And I find out that- uh, So at the time- high level, uh, Obviously say at the time, you had the kendo school, it became a kendo and a jiu-jitsu school, but at the time the jiu-jitsu was Japanese jiu-jitsu, you, you weren't fully yes. into BJJ yet? No, I was more involved, uh, I was a Moni Isaac uh, student for judo, and also Moni teacher at that time judo and jiu-jitsu, I'm talking about the 1975. 1975, I was student also, I did also Krav Maga with different uh, instructors, but judo was very attractive because of the uh, i would say the the magic of judo that the uh, leverage and uh, the use of force is is, is excellent like you I, i'm using your force it's not a force system and the krav maga at that time that was really very primitive and not uh, I, I don't judge it it was uh, not so much developed and uh, i prefer to move myself into judo and uh, when I teach in the in '92, when I return to Israel, I teach basically judo for old people. I call it because you know you cannot take old people and start to throw them; you break their bones. So, and we didn't have a floating floor. So I I did a lot of ground fight, and actually in '92 I was uh, not doing BJJ, but I did a lot of lewaza. Because when I was a, a kid in 1975, Newaza was a big part, ground fight of judo and jiu-jitsu. And uh, I started to move into BJJ only in 2001, when I moved to Los Angeles and I became Professor Machado, John Machado student. And I started with a white belt. Even I had all my titles in judo and all my titles in jiu-jitsu. When they asked me, I said, no, I just, like any kid, I study, you know, when you have to fill out your background, I said, no, I do a little bit martial art like any kid. But after two months, uh, Professor John Machado looked at me and he said, who are you? And then he researched and uh, he never forgot this to me. But I really want to study everything from the beginning. And uh, there were a lot of things that I knew. But then why the BJJ do them this thing? And I find out a totally similar world but totally different. It's like I'm doing karate and I'm coming to study uh, Kung Fu. We all punch, we all, but there's a little bit differences. And uh, I really start from white belt to blue. And the BJJ joined to the Kapapen system just later, but the first was Japanese uh, Jiu Jitsu. This is why when we complete the circle or the last triangle, it was Kapap, Krav Maga, and Israeli Jiu-Jitsu because I brought a lot of things from Israel and I mixed them with Japanese Jiu-Jitsu and then with BJJ. So I'm actually not teaching BJJ pure. If you want BJJ pure, you have to go to BJJ pure. And um, 
if you want to have uh, Japanese, you have to go to traditional Japanese. I teach a mix. And this is why when people ask me, oh, do you teach BJJ? I say, I teach also BJJ, but it's a part of what I do. So this is why even in Israel, like uh, if you look for the jiu-jitsu teachers in Israel, like uh, Eran Bert, BJJ, is my ex-student. Uh, Ido Pariente in Israel is my ex-student for jiu-jitsu. Now they're doing more BJJ. I'm not, I stay in jiu-jitsu. Even I'm a black belt in BJJ, and even the Machado family respected and like it. Even. They say, you should do it. You should teach everything. You cannot forget everything and now concentrate only in Americana, Kimura, BJJ. You must teach how the BJJ uh, can yonatide, actually, and this is what we do. We don't, how I can uh, put my Judo, my BJJ, my Krav Maga, everything together, and how to complete each other and to, you know, to flatter to each other, not to counter each other. Mm -hmm. So Sorry for long, but... Yeah, sure. No, that's, it's a great answer. So nowadays, uh, and perhaps that would be our final question for this interview, but I'll definitely have you all back on the, the podcast uh, at a later date, because Avi is such a treasure trove of, of knowledge and experience, and we would like to hear more from him about many different subjects. But uh, let me ask you about this phenomenon that I see nowadays of MMA schools in the United States calling themselves Krav Maga, because Krav Maga is, is a big brand in the United States right now, and this is the year 2020. And uh, but it, the phenomenon I'm describing had been around for probably the past 20 years. But then we have Krav Maga schools in Israel begin to call themselves MMA schools. It's just the opposite because in Israel, uh, MMA has become very popular over the past 20 years. So, what do you think about that, Avi? <coughs> you know, I'm a long time also <coughs> student of uh, Hanshi Patrick McCarthy with the karate Koryu Chinadi, which is very open mind karate, and also with Aiki Kempo Jiu Jitsu. That's why. I have also very strong Japanese way. And when uh, my friend Bruce Kivo is running uh, a program uh, about MMA, MMA Confidential, and he asked me, what is Krav Maga, what is it? And he says, it's MMA for self-defense. But watch out my word, MMA for self-defense, not for ego. Uh, in the MMA, there's a lot of uh, ego, trash talk, all of these uh, foolish things that I see with the uh, death, uh, Dana, whatever, UFC. I don't like it, sorry. Uh, I don't like uh, a lot of those kind of uh, insulting. Uh, I don't want to talk about names, but uh, I even, um, you know, people that running programs to insult uh, big uh, names in martial arts because now they're doing MMA or they're doing uh, BJJ in the wrong way because you will never hear from Machado never insult on any martial art all the martial arts are great so the thing to to you know like everyone tried to do a sell so what is the best seller in the US Krav Maga what is the best seller in because in Israel everyone know everyone know Krav Maga maybe it's it's a put a question it's like why do you think if I am born in Israel I will go travel to Japan, fight for eight years to get visa, jobs, I'm a foreigner, language, food, everything, live by myself to study arts if Krav Maga was so great? I think this answer. And why if Krav Maga is so great, they want to do MMA and not to sell it as Krav Maga? Because maybe in Israel, not many people uh, interesting about Krav Maga. And maybe, you know, like, in Japan, not so many. I remember when I was in Japan, my, my teacher used to laugh. He said to me, one day Japanese will come to study from you swordmanship. And it's happening. Because uh, the young generation, they don't like, they want something new. You know, it's like a provocat. And in Israel, a lot of people, oh, Krav Maga, no. 
oh, MMA is cool because we see it in TV. I don't know. I can tell you that it's a, it's a funny, but uh, I think that Krav Maga is actually MMA for self-defense. And I prefer MMA for self-defense than MMA for the ring. I'm not interested about competition with anybody. The only competition and the strongest one that I ever had and I will ever hear, uh, will, it's against myself. So for me, I don't want to fight other people and then understand to fight with myself. I already understand it many years ago. Fight with yourself is the strongest fight you can ever do. The thing that you defeat somebody don't mean that you prove something in yourself. The thing that somebody defeats you don't make you grow up. So this is why um, I see Ramadan for self-defense as an MMA better than to do it for ego. But, uh, you know, ego sell much better. That's why we have Ego Total and all of those programs uh, to, to promote the ego. Um, but that's, that's against actually self-defense. You know, when, when I saw slogan in Krav Maga, touch me in your first classes for free, I was laughing. Now you don't understand nothing about Krav Maga because it's immediately ego. And, and Krav Maga is anti-ego. You cannot be ego. You cannot be arrogant. And you've been in the Israeli army. And I will ask you, what is more in the Israeli army that we emphasize than humanitarian and morality? All the time we try to teach the soldier two things, to be very human. And whenever there is a earthquake in Turkey, in Mexico, you immediately see the IDF, the Israeli army, send humanitarian doctors, military doctors, military equipment, military nurse as a humanitarian. So humanitarians and morality is what is Krav Maga also for me. And that's what I'm trying also to, to push my students, not to ego, to be more human. Um, last year, I mean, we had to go again, but Corona delay everything. But last year, my wife went and uh, helped to build a dojo in uh, the biggest slum in Africa. The biggest slum in Africa, and now there's a dojo. <laughs> there's also four kids. They, they're calling them babies, Avinardia. And uh, it's because respect, you know, that we try to help them. And I think this is the this is Krav Maga for me. Krav Maga is not about uh, to take from people. It's what you can give to people. And, and we try to give, of course, knowledge. But uh, um, we try to take a slum that if you see the interview, people that uh, kids that doing drugs, they have no future. And now you give them a future through Krav Maga. So for me, this is the Krav Maga, not uh, that some celeb uh, study Kabbalah and now he study Krav Maga and all of this, uh, you know, like uh, Hollywood uh, nonsense. So um, I think that Krav Maga is also about friendship. And, um, you know, like uh, I try to teach my students about yeah, okay. Krav Maga, they teach their friendship. All right, Avi, so I would like to ask you, since there's so many schools and styles and sub-styles of Krav Maga out there in Israel and abroad, how would I know, if I'm looking to study Krav Maga, what, what's a good school to choose? What are the criteria? What should I look for? I know we, we, we can talk about what to look for in a good martial arts school, but what's specific to Krav Maga that, that should be a good idea to look for? You know, my old teacher for swords, he became blind and uh, deaf and, you know, very old, very sick. And uh, I went to see him in Japan, one of my teachers. And uh, at that visit, uh, some, some guy uh, that is from Japan and he's a Krav Maga instructor uh, joined me as a friend. And when my teacher asked him, oh, what are you doing? And he said, I'm doing Krav Maga. So my teacher told him, oh, where did you study? He said, oh, I was in Israel. And he said, how many years you studied in Israel? And he said to him, like, oh, I was a week. <laughs> and uh, you should see that all the, the blind man opened my eyes. 
Like uh, the guy was for one week in Israel and now he very graduated the Krav Maga. I study almost eight years in Japan. And I cannot compare myself to an eight done in Japan uh, doing uh, different arts. I would never dare even to think. But uh, what I'm trying to say is that, uh, you know, my friend in Slovenia, he had a student with a yellow belt. The next day, the guy go to Israel and now he's a Krav Maga, whatever. I think sometimes to get popular and, you know, like all of this, uh, popular, uh, international, this, people stop to looking for quality. And I think like any other university, it's like many people now, even martial artists, that have no finished high school, but now you see doctor this and this, doctor this and this. Everyone now in martial art in Israel, they have do a PhD, doctor. And when you check their PhD, it's a joke. It's like uh, nobody knows this university. and you know, you can buy any title today, even a PhD. So what is to buy a title in uh, martial art? So we're talking about something that is not only for Krav Maga, it's for any martial art. And sometimes I'm getting a message, people that want to represent me. And the guy, I tell you another story, I'm sorry. But uh, I've been in a seminar and a guy asked me how he can represent me and he was very impressed. And I told him the process. And one day I walk and I see a Krav Maga school in Denver. I went to sushi and then my friend want to practice. So I said, don't tell him who I am. I just go. And when I came, the guy said, oh, Avinati, Avinati. And then he reminded me that he was in my seminar. And I tried to be very nice and everything. And then he told me, you know, after your seminar, because you talk so high about the Machado family, I went to Machado, to Professor Machado's school. And I told them, look, I'm going to open a new school uh, for Krav Maga, and I want also to represent you. And the guy said to me, wow, wonderful. And he said, yes, wonderful. What I need to do to represent you? And <laughs> Professor Machado told him, well, you have to come twice a day for practice, morning and night, five days minimum a week for 10 years, and then you can represent me. <laughs> So the guy told me and I was laughing because he was representing also other BJJ and he, he tried to apologize why he don't represent me and Machado. So I will say, if you see that the teacher in the school uh, work with the serious teachers, if the school have a high requirements, like higher requirements in university, it might be a good school. And uh, the most important that this, the teacher don't develop uh, ego. The teacher promote friendship and like a family. And not a, you know, now, because I say, one day I say Kappa family and everyone became Kappa, uh, you know, craft family, everyone is a family. And I tell you a last story about family. One day a guy get lost in the forest and uh, he see a monkey. And the monkey told him, I'll take you to the gate. But on the way, suddenly a tiger jumped on them. So the monkey grabbed him and take him up on the tree. And uh, then after like two hours on the tree, the monkey got tired, the man got tired. So the monkey tell to the man, you know what? You go to sleep and I will watch you. And then I'll sleep and you watch me. So the man sleep and the tiger tell to the, to the monkey, push him down, I eat him and you can go free. But the monkey said, no, we are family. We're not doing those kind of things in the family. So the man get up, the monkey go to sleep. And then the tiger tell to the man, you know, drop him down and I will eat him and you are free. So the man immediately keep the monkey down. But the monkey is very fast. You know, once he fall down, he climb on the tree again. And the man and the monkey, they look at each other. They knew what happened but they don't talk about it. You know, it's what happened in Vegas, don't talk. So the tiger fall to sleep. And when the tiger fall to sleep, the monkey grabbed the man and said, let's go, let's go, put him on the gate. And the man just told him, you know, they're looking. And then the monkey told the man, can I ask you one, one, one favor? Never mention that we're family again. <laughs> so <laughs> this is my words for all those uh, Krav uh, families. I made the word family and then I told them this story. 
because everyone is a family and then they back stabbing you. So don't look for family. You have your own family. You're not orphan. Don't look for, I don't know, just for fun and friendship. It's okay. It's also nice to be in a club, you know, like, but if you look, look for the skill, look that the teacher uh, is honest, is giving as best as a teacher. He really try to teach you and you really study something and he don't force you to what you are not and he, he grow with you together. And I mean, I always ask myself why I always choose my teachers for a great teachers. I don't complain about any teachers. And then you have those guys that uh, they're coming also to me and I immediately kick them out. They complain about their teachers. And I say, I'm worried from those guys. Why you choose from the beginning bad teachers? Why don't research? And uh, I'm sure you're also in martial arts. You know, you, you, can, you can know when the teacher is good. And if you look for shortcut, if you look for a university just to get PhD, and what do I do for to get the PhD? Oh, come for one week and give me one, one paper, draw a painting for me of a dog. Oh, PhD. Then it's not a serious university. So I blame the students, by the way. I don't blame the teachers. People always blame the teachers. Oh, he's a fake. No, the student is a fake. Why those students looking always for a shortcut? Why they don't look for strict teachers? You know Sifu Sapir. You know Sifu Sapir. Yeah, we're talking uh, about uh, my, my sovereign man to Sifu, uh, Sifu Sapir Tal from Israel. And you know how tough his teacher was and how hard he was on his students and how the students really had to follow to be there. So I will say that, uh, you know, sometimes I kick a student out and if instead of come and apologize, he's looking at me, yeah, who are you? And then you go to another one and you get, I don't know, 10 down or whatever. So this is the main problem. So I believe that everyone have his own cover. You know, every pot has his own cover. And the people that are serious, they will find serious teachers. The people look for shortcuts or for ranks or... You know, people say black belt is to hold the pants, and I say it's not true. And I always show them that I take my belt and my pants don't fall. Anybody that uh, dress uh, martial arts, you know, like pants with the wire. My belt show my devoted to martial art. And I'm proud about my belt because uh, it show also level and it shows skills. Of course, if you buy your belt, and I just had a conversation today with a friend in, uh, he, he used to be a Thai boxer and I came to do a seminar in Japan at uh, Nicolas Petas uh, school, K1 and this. And my friend told me, we just talked about this today. And he reminded me, and it, at that seminar, one of the guy was a world champion or in the championship. And my friend, when I choose him as a, as a partner, and my friend told me, oh, watch out, this guy is kick very strong. And I told him, it's okay. I don't know who he is, but I know who I am. And that's my black belt. I don't care who you are. I know who is my teacher. I know Machado. I know Kubo Akira Sensei. I know Hanshi Patrick McCarthy. I know those teachers, they didn't give me the belts because I paid money. They didn't give me because, I don't know, I'm a nice guy. I work very, very hard for my belts. I work very hard for my skills. And I think that... Um, Students that look for that, they will find that. Students that are yellow belt in Slovenia and running to Israel to some yo-yo and after one week coming and they are the director. What kind of a rank is a director? I'm a director of this organization or this organization. Are you director or are you a sensei? What is your rank? You know how many times people tell me, oh, I, tr you know, I see Kramaga, I have intense... Uh, a martial art background in judo and BJJ. And I said, what belt? No, I, I trained many years. What belt? In judo, we have belt. I have fifth dan. In uh, jiu-jitsu Japanese, I have seventh dan. In BJJ, I'm a black belt. In, in, so this is the teacher. And I tell, if you look for forums, people always judging other teachers. I ask my students to challenge me. 
ask me who I am and challenge me. You are more than welcome. I'm like Toys R Us, you know, try me. But uh, I'm not insulted. I think that uh, people, instructors, that uh, talking always about other names and tell you, this guy is very bad, this guy is very bad, something is wrong with them. Oh, okay, Challenge so uh, Avi, Avi, let me, let me just try to summarize some of that advice because it's a bit all over the place and, and incorporated into these uh, interesting stories and life experience. So you're saying, first of all, you want to, to see that the teacher at the school that you're looking for doesn't have too much of an ego. Second of all, that the teacher treats the school like a community or like a family and does that genuinely. Third of all, that the teacher is not trying to sell you shortcuts, right? That he's willing to tell you to your face that the, the road's going to be long and hard and it's fine. And, that's, and, and it, he tells you or she tells you what you really need to expect. Now, fourth, you're just talking about the teacher being proud of who he is and being honest about his rank or title and that these, these ranks or titles are legit and that they're relevant to the system that he came from. It's not just a made up rank or a title, right? These are the main four things that you were just talking about? About, yes. Okay. And, and, so, but specifically for Krav Maga, so I, I could step into a martial arts school, say in the United States, and have all of these good things, and still it doesn't really mean that it's Krav Maga, because these are good things to look for in any martial arts school. How do I know it's um, Krav Maga and it's not the see, Okinawan Karate that was dressed up like Krav Maga, or MMA that was dressed up in, like Krav Maga? Well, in many, in many cases, it will be, first of all, not to make any illusion. In many things, uh, even for me, I look and I don't know what they're doing. But there's also nothing wrong with it as long as you like it, as long as it's efficient. Because what is, again, Krav Maga? Krav Maga, if you look, okay, today is more sophisticated. But let's say, take it to the old way. It's a, it's a bad variation of karate, in my opinion. Again, I'm not trying to insult, but uh, why you want to punch like this? <laughs> you know, like the guy is here and the punch, why you want to punch like that when the punch is like this? But with the time, everything getting better. Everyone study more, is experience. Um, but the, the Krav Maga never had a ground program before. Then the Krav Maga, when BJJ started, they adopted the BJJ. With the time, they adopted maybe from uh, videos. With the time, maybe some of them also went and studied properly. Uh, you know, like when you read originally Krav Maga, and I'm talking about most of organization that disrespect all others, they will always mention that Imi was a boxer. And You're my question about, uh, was... Imi, Imi Lichtenfeld, yeah? One Imi of Lichtenfeld of was a, a boxer. A boxer and a wrestler. That should be like what I do. I'm mixing wrestling, I call it BJJ, judo, wrestling, yes, grappling with boxing or Thai boxing. So why you don't see the, all those claims to be the original Krav Maga that they're doing boxing? Where's the old boxing dreams? Why only last two years they start to study boxing? They're going to some guys, they're teaching boxing in Israel and taking class. Again, it's good, it's great, because at least they're fixing themselves slowly. You know, when I start 20 years ago, and they said there's no kapap, and now they copy kapap, now they're the, the real kapap, the original kapap, whatever. You, you know, it's martial art. And when I was laughing because they don't know from which side to hold the gun, now they're going and studying. Before they're holding the gun in different, you know, jokes. Now, at least they're going and they're taking uh, firearm classes. Now they're going and taking boxing classes, BJJ classes. I'm happy because now my critic was generic. I never critic on a personal name, but the critical made all of those people that uh, to grow too. You know, I had a student of, uh, you know, when I had my school in Israel in the 90s, I had a student, his name was Shai. 
And uh, in my classes, it was not so good. Honestly, because every time you get a punch, is judo finished. You know, we have a saying in judo that uh, when a judoka is a black belt, you get punch, he became a brown belt. Second punch, he became a green belt. It's a mm -hmm. joke because we're not used to do this. And when I teach jujitsu, I mix judo and Thai box. And the guy, once we play only judo, we'll throw everyone. But once he starts to get involved with uh, impact, he had a problem. And I called his parents and I said to them that, uh, in my opinion, he's a very talented judo and he's wasting his time in my classes. And I took him to my friend, Yona Melnik, which was uh, the national uh, judo team coach in Israel. And I remember even Yona was a little bit arrogant at that time because he put him with some guy that had to go to the Olympic. And of course, he throws shy everywhere. And then he told me, he's not so good. And then shy started to throw the other guy. And then Yona look and says, okay, I accept him. But what I want to tell you, that this shy, he became in the Israeli national team. He was Israeli national uh, champion. He was in the international teams. And then after the army, he contacted me. I was already in the US. And he asked me because he wanted to do Krav Maga. And I didn't want to talk shit about anything. So I told him, look, just go and look. Anyway, he go to the school and then he called me like two days after. And he said, oh, don't ask what happened. And what happened? The guy go to a Krav Maga school and the guy tried to hold him what we call in Judo Kesa Katana. And shy looking at this and he tell the teacher, yes, but uh, forgive me, but I don't understand why you hold him like this because he can go out. And the teacher told him, oh, what can go out? Come over here. And he, her. <laughs> he hold him and of course shy get out. And then the teacher get angry and told him, yeah, oh, yeah, if you do, I can do it too. And then he hold the teacher and the teacher could not go out. So the teacher think he did it purposely. He didn't. But then he called me and he says, why he teach Kesa Katane, which is a pure judo in his Krav Maga, and he even don't have any background in judo. And I said, don't ask me. And this is uh, for you, that sometimes people, they're doing different stuff and they title it with different names. And this is said, how to know? I have no idea. I can tell you that uh, watch out from forums, watch out from media. The media is very, very difficult. You know that uh, Krav Maga tried to assassinate me, character assassination for years. Because when I came to the market, I was like a Porsche, suddenly standing with a Cessna. And uh, they, they, they put any light they could put on me. They say I was never in the Israeli army. I'm an Israeli major. They say I was never in this unit. When they see the letter, uh, media can destroy you very easy. And today, a lot of people using media as a marketing system, mostly like forum. You know, if you're the forum of Krav Maga, they try to destroy the guy. Oh, mostly those big schools uh, that are more economically, I would say, they are more working like, you know, um, they have marketing people and they have people to advise them how to bash other people. So I don't know how to recommend. I can tell you that you, I, I believe in energy. I go in a place and I try to, to feel. And I never got a mistake. All the teachers that uh, I've been with, I still admire them. I still respect them. I still think I, I, I did a great job by choosing them. And Japanese say, it's better to look for the right teacher for 15 years than start 15 years earlier. All right, Avi, thank you so much for answering all of those questions. I think this was a fascinating discussion that our listeners would definitely, definitely benefit from. Uh, Avi, you are traveling and giving seminars all over the world, teaching your Kapap system, BJJ, and all sorts of other things too. If people want to learn more about what you do and reach out, where should they go? Go to my personal website. It's uh, avinardia.com. Mm -hmm. Okay. A-D-I. 
N-A-R-D-I-A, avinardia.com. And you can go to the blog to read the uh, opinions, articles. You can uh, look for DVDs. But yeah. uh, honestly, in DVDs, I don't put too much. I put, you know, part of knowledge so nobody can copy, really. It's funny uh, because uh, Avi Sensei has been putting out, out video material for many years now. And his instructional videos have been pirated several times over. And what happens often, he tells me that his adversaries, people who just don't like him in the martial arts would pirate his videos and then also copy them and make similar videos or teach that in that curriculum. And Avi, what do you say whenever tr someone tries to uh, make a video that copies from your videos or imitate your material? You have a good answer for that. Well, in every video, I don't put all the information. So immediately, if I show you the all information, you know who copy and who lie. And, uh, you know, mostly it's the, the real deal. Mostly it's the people that claim that they are the real. But uh, these pirates of video and pirates of knowledge, look, look at the Krav Maga from the 70s, from the 80s. Look at the material and look how it changed. And ask yourself, why? Until 2000, they all looks the same, and only now they start to change things based about things that been in Kapar. Of course, uh, it's great because my job is to save life by, by teaching. And I don't care even if they don't give me credit, but right now they're teaching their students to do better and more right things. Uh, of course, I'm mad because it's a copyright like uh, any writer. I'm not writing, but I'm, I'm developing techniques or I'm mixing techniques that work perfect. And uh, of course, in a way, it's like disappointed. Uh, but I, I want to ask you, wherever you see Krav Maga instructor um, credit, oh, this is uh, also Tugari from Judo, or this is uh, low kick. Uh, a lot of time people use it in Thai box. They all made their own, but I never saw a Krav Maga technique like kick is a judo, uh, it kick is karate or Thai box. What is a Mai Geri or a front kick? Even Kida, they all talk about Kida. Kida is a bow. Since when in the Judaism we bow or in Israel? It's a, yeah. it's a copy of Japanese tradition. More than this, in the Bible, Jewish obligated not to bow. I don't allow my students to bow unless I teach jujitsu, but I don't allow. Krav Maga cannot have kida because it says in the Bible that you are not allowed to bow to statues, to stones, including people. Uh, just That's to why, you, give, uh, give you the, the background here, uh, obviously he's not a religious person at all, a fully secular person. Oh, totally right? no. Oh, only yesterday I slept therapy. No. So, uh, but, but the, the context. But is, I know, I know everything I know about religion. You know, I can argue with rabbi. It's not uh, that I'm not religion by, by uh, stupidity. I know the moral. So the, the context here is that traditionally Jews only bow before God. So a lot of Jewish people, usually um, religious people in Israel, feel very uncomfortable with the concept of bowing in, in martial arts. Uh, but it, it's, well, some schools uh, do away with it entirely. In other schools, they just say, okay, we, we, it's just a show of respect. You know, it's not a, a religious act, so it's all right. But it's a, a contentious uh, issue in Israel. Yes, most certainly. All right, Avi, so uh, to wrap up, if people want to- to let you know, when I yeah, teach sure. Kendo, which is very traditional Japanese, the, if you've been uh, religion, I don't allow you to bow. Hmm. I teach it because I teach it Japanese traditional in way, but even my students, if they go to Japan, I explain to the teachers that they cannot bow and it's, it's, it's okay. Hmm. Bow means to show respect. You don't need to bow to show respect. All right. But yeah, that's, that's, that's important. I see in the last few years in, 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 in Israeli martial arts, they start to put Kida, like a bow. I'm always 
I have no problem, you know, like, uh, but you, you know that uh, in Judaism, we're not allowed to bow. Yeah, it's, it, it, it does make for a strange cultural introduction into uh, a Jewish society. So with that said, um, like we... It's a Jewish uh, and Israeli tradition to put Kedah, it's a little bit out of the, uh, you know, like the traditional of the Israelis. Yes, so it's tradition, Israeli. tradition against tradition. Yes. All right, Avi, come on. So we have had a great talk. If you want to reach Avi, if you'd like to have him for a seminar, come study with him, do a one-on-one -on -one thing. He does it all. He's all over the world. He's the probably the most active uh, internationally, uh, international teaching uh, Israeli instructor and has been for, I don't know, since forever, maybe. Uh, he probably taught the most seminars of any Israeli teacher abroad. Uh, probably the record holder with that. So go to avinardia.com. That's A-V-I-N-A-R-D-I-A.com to learn more about him. Avi, thank you so much for being with us on the podcast today. We'll certainly have you here again. Thank you. Thank you for everyone. Whew, that was quite a talk, wasn't it, friends? Avi Sensei is such a rich source of knowledge. He's like a fountain that keeps on giving, right? He's just great. And we could uh, get talking for hours. In fact, I have on occasion sat down with him and we talked for six or seven hours. And that's why I'm going to have him back on the podcast in the future, at least twice or thrice more over the years, to make sure that we get more of this quality information that he has to share based on his very vast experience in the martial arts. Now, what did you think about this wonderful interview? Did you enjoy it? Did you learn something new? Would you like to ask more questions about Krav Maga or Israeli martial arts and culture? There's so much I wanted to cover that we didn't even get to. The development of martial arts in Israel in general. Other Israeli martial arts practitioners and their styles and schools, etc., etc. So, so much to talk about. And, and definitely I'm going to have other Israelis on the podcast talking about the martial arts as well. Uh, and also, of course, many more instructors from all over the world. So if you would like to share your thoughts or questions, say anything whatsoever, please feel free to do so in the comments below this uh, the video of this interview on YouTube. And if you're interested in more such fascinating information about the martial arts, then you know where to go already, right? You go on Amazon and you can write my name, Jonathan Bluestein, in the search box, you'd find my books, or you can use the specific names of some of these books. You can write Research of Martial Arts, Research of Martial Arts, my first book, an international bestseller. Or you could write The Martial Arts Teacher. You definitely get to some place you would be interested in. There are hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews you can read to figure out what these books are about. Otherwise, if you'd like to know more about what Avi Sensei is doing. So like we said, you go on avinardia.com. That's A-V-I-N-A-R-D-I-A.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what I teach and what I do, then you're most welcome to visit my website. That is bluejadesociety.com. Blue like the color blue. Jade like the gemstone jade. Society like a society. Dot com. In any case... See you next time, folks, and thank you for listening. Whew, that was quite a talk, wasn't it, friends? Avi Sensei is such a rich source of knowledge. He's like a fountain that keeps on giving, right? He's just great. And we could uh, get talking for hours. In fact, I have on occasion sat down with him and we talked for six or seven hours. That's why I'm going to have him back on the podcast in the future, at least twice or thrice more over the years, to make sure that we get more of this quality information that he has to share based on his very vast experience in the martial arts. Now, what did you think about this wonderful interview? Did you enjoy it? Did you learn something new? Would you like to ask more questions about Krav Maga or Israeli martial arts and culture? There's so much I wanted to cover that we didn't even get to. The development of martial arts in Israel in general. 
other Israeli martial arts practitioners and their styles and schools, etc., etc. So, so much to talk about. And, and definitely, I'm going to have other Israelis on the podcast talking about the martial arts as well. Uh, and also, of course, many more instructors from all over the world. So, if you would like to share your thoughts or questions, say anything whatsoever, please feel free to do so in the comments below this uh, the video of this interview on YouTube. And if you're interested in more such fascinating information about the martial arts, then you know where to go already, right? You go on Amazon and you can write my name, Jonathan Bluestein, in the search box. You'd find my books or you can use the specific names of some of these books. You can write Research of Martial Arts. Research of Martial Arts, my first book, international bestseller. Or you could write The Martial Arts Teacher. You definitely get to someplace you would be interested and there are hundreds and hundreds of positive reviews you can read to figure out what these books are about. Otherwise, if you'd like to know more about what Avi Sensei is doing, so like we said, you go on avinardia.com, that's A-V-I-N-A-R-D-I-A.com. And if you'd like to learn more about what I teach and what I do, then you're most welcome to visit my website, that is bluejadesociety.com. Blue like the color blue. Jade like the gemstone jade. Society like a society. Dot com. In any case, see you next time, folks. And thank you for listening.